Every man takes the limits of his own vision for the limits of the world. And this is the spell that we attempt to break in our chaos. We understand that the unknown can be discovered by clearly marking the boundaries of the known. And we also, we also understand that we cannot use two unknowns defining one another and conclude that we have learned anything at all. But this is the patterning of the collective. This is what they do. They invent a scenario and then use it to show justification for the belief in all others. And this doesn't work. Because investigations of the world, they must be ongoing. The limits of our knowledge can never be reached and a move in the wrong direction can always be a part of finding the right direction. As we acquire knowledge, Things do not become more comprehensible, they become more mysterious. And one's level of ignorance increases exponentially with accumulated knowledge. And the longer one searches, the greater he discov discovers the area of his ignorance to be. Because one can know a lot about something and still not understand it. I've told you guys many times that one who is properly informed is not easily deceived. And I hope that I have maintained this integrity through my presentations, that you have seen that it is not inventiveness that drives the archaic material, but the actual finding of these gems in old books, things that we can verify, things that I have shown you that have either been scrubbed for the internet or they were never included to begin with. But unfortunately, even, even these demonstrations, these presentations, the materials in my published books, even 200 articles, over 480 videos, it's still not enough. The average person, when told the truth, will still seek some other way. Archaics is for free thinkers. If we are content to live in the opinions of others, we have no truth of our own. Because we have to adopt the model of Socrates and all the things that are propagated worldwide today, the belief systems, the faith, the ideologies, the philosophies, the mysteries, the histories, these things that are given to us freely by the establishment, these are the things that we must scrutinize. We cannot accept them in blind faith. We must adopt the scrutiny of Socrates, who said, doubt is the origin of truth. Further, <clears throat> it is the position of archaics that even the things that make us uncomfortable, they must be examined. Truth must be reported. 
History cannot be ignored because it offends. But this is not an easy position to take because the world loves to be deceived. In fact, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And there will always be Agent Smiths. There will be agents of disinformation. There will always be Smithsonian institutions. There will always be intelligence apparatuses set in place to darken the minds of the collective so they cannot see the world for what it really is. Men will endeavor to invalidate that evidence which tends to unveil their dark designs. Yes, guys, it's not as easy as... as the position of some who believe that history is just unknown. That's not the situation we're confronted with. History is known, but those who know it keep it from the rest of us. The collective, their beliefs, the things that are universally taught, these things are wrong. Frederick Nietzsche was not in error over a hundred years ago when he said that all the world believes so is already an objection to it. Because things do not count for what they are, but what they seem. In Archaics, it is our position that the only way to awaken is to first realize that you are asleep and that the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. For it is a curious fact of nature that that which is in plain view is often the best hidden. In the amalgamation of so much data over the past 20 years, the isolation of particulars to show patterns that aren't readily available to others who have been gleaning their information from filtered sources, like the internet, which was exactly what it was designed to do. Most of the researchers of today have abandoned the, the gleaning of data from older sources, pre-internet sources, pre-World War II sources, sources from the 1800s. Listen, I'm not ever going to try and convince people that all the data in old books is correct, but the corrected versions of history can be more easily found by just perusing the older texts. And this is a problem. This means that the institutions of the world that are foisted upon us, the, schol the scholastic, the academic, all these scenarios in world history that have been given to us, force-fed to us through educational programs, they're false. They are not an accurate depiction of the reality that we're experiencing. And this is where we get our psychosis. This is where we get our disconnectedness, our problems. This is where, where the things that we feel intrinsically deep within us, we know there is something wrong, but we can't pinpoint it. It is because the data saturation that we suffer here in the 21st century is a deliberate program to keep you from understanding where you came from and where you're going. And this deception is very, very easy to foist upon the population because in today, today people are trained to basically believe in falsehoods to believe in the establishment, to believe in the plan. Today, few men think, yet all will have opinions. And this is what social media has done. It has basically turned opinions into narratives, narratives into facts, facts into, into beliefs. And these beliefs have guided people into many different directions that has increased their sorrow and disconnected it connectedness from the very reality that they're experiencing right now, which could be totally different with an accurate assessment and understanding of the past. In my own research, in my own presentations, in my own dealings with my fellow men, I employ basically the patterning of Herodotus, who 2,400 years ago 
specifically wrote in his huge book, The Histories, my business is to record what people say, but I am by no means bound to believe it. That's a true historian, someone who ascertains the facts, talks to people, has boots on the ground, goes around and collects all this data and doesn't filter it out, doesn't practice exclusions, even when he himself disbelieves some of the things he is recording. And through my presentations, I have tried to maintain this integrity, and I will continue to do so. I have hundreds of more presentations to go. We are far from done in archaics. But I also live by this integrity, this, this basically, this philosophy of the old historians. Never will I can, I will never consent to conceal my beliefs, nor shall my opinions ever be at war with my tongue. It won't happen. There would be no censorship if there wasn't something important to censor. There wouldn't be any misinformation if there weren't any truths that needed to be hidden. The programs that are set in place to deceive the populace into false narratives of history and to create social conditions based off these false narratives, these things were set in place by someone, something. Archaic strives to pull the pieces of the past into the present so we can better understand the construct as it's being built around us by someone. We do this through several different methods. We understand the wisdom of Lewis Mumford, who said, Time is measured not by the calendar, but by the events that occupy it. And this I have striven to show through my presentations, hundreds, maybe even thousands of independently dated events that I have showed you that are in cycles and epicycles, and many of them have predictive value. And we also follow the wisdom of Gerald Massey, who published in the 1880s, that it is impossible to understand the present without the profoundest knowledge of the past. And of course, we all know George Orwell, 1984, goes without saying, it should be a mantra of the elite themselves. Who controls the past controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past. It's censorship. It's exactly what they're talking about. Another hero of mine, George Santayana, who said, those who cannot remember the past are those who are condemned to repeat it. Again, the French writer, philosopher, Albert Camus, he's a dry read, but he provides some really good gemstones in his materials. One of those was that he wrote that the last pages of a book are already contained in the first pages. And this reminds me of the presentations that I have done on the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, which was not originally a Christian document, but belonged to a far older civilization. And that the symbols and the motifs that are encoded within the Apocalypse in the book of, of the Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, the Omega text, its precedents are not found within the New Testament nor the Old Testament. There are there are 62 books for which the book of Revelation has absolutely no correlates with. But there's one book that the symbols of the Revelation can easily be decoded by because those same symbols are found in their more primitive forms only in the book of Genesis, which is the Alpha text. This amazing cipher, the codes of the book of Genesis comport with those of the book of Revelation and tell us a fascinating story of resets, of the phoenix phenomenon, of the rebirth of the world after it is destroyed and how humans are in the construct. And everything in between, all this biblical material from the book of Exodus all the way to the book of Jude right before Revelation we find is this massive corpus of pseudo-history 
built upon actual historical events by a people who did not participate in them, but injected themselves into the narratives. The Bible is therefore both a book of good and evil, and it's up to you to discern which. Also, Firmicus Maternus. Firmicus Maternus wrote, that the beginning of anything was to be found out by the unfolding of historical events, and I have done this meticulously. My archaics veterans know that I have not slacked in my showing of the events of the 5th, 4th, and 3rd millennium BC, the cycles and epicycles, Phoenix phenomenon, Jubilee counts, the cursed earth periods, the Phoenix cycles. These things are all shown in the 138-year periodicity, 414-year epics, and the 552-year cycles of Phoenix, and how all the events of the ancient world fit within this patterning, and that these calendars overlay each other perfectly. And there's a synthetic timeline that I have published called Chronicon that shows all these calendars and how they work together, showing that the events of the ancient world actually explain to us the world we're in now and the world that is about to unfold in the next 17 years. This is why the eschatological text, this is why the prophetic materials are always so dependent upon the historical narratives, be they in metaphor, allegory, or codes, be they literal his historical events, it doesn't matter. They are dependent upon each other. And Oxford professor and Nobel laureate Frederick Soddy said it best, civilization is not a continuous self-supporting movement. The conditions under which it originates determine its period and fix the date of its decline. He said this in 1911, and he was absolutely correct. The, the events of the world today are in direct juxtaposition with the events of the ancient world, and what will begin to unfold in 17 years is precisely what happened back then as well. And to understand the return of the vapor canopy and the Phoenix phenomenon of May 2040, we must decode and understand exactly how the Phoenix phenomenon shaped the world we live in and ended civilization after civilization after civilization and how communities of survivors built the next epic. And living at the same time as Professor Saudi was another one of my heroes, the student of Gurdjieff, P.D. Alspensky. Mr. Alspensky published over a hundred years ago in Tertium Organum. Future events are wholly contained in preceding ones. And if we could know the force and direction of all events which have happened up until the present moment, for example, if we knew all the past, by this we could know all the future. In just a few short years after that, in Technics and Civilization, a huge treatise the learned Lewis Mumford wrote, The past that is already dead remains present in the future that has yet to be born. In these modern scholarly statements, they're merely a reflection of the older thinkers like Niccolo Machiavelli, who wrote, If one examines with diligence the past, it is easy to foresee the future. In archaics, we hold that, it, that a acute study, a minute study of the past is absolutely necessary because we live in a world where people don't see the world as it really is. Even if they had the intelligence, they do not have the desire. And most men, they occasionally stumble over the truth, but they pick themselves back up and continue on as if nothing happened. And I understand their positions. I understand this, this revulsion some people have with examining these deeper issues that we cover in archaics. In fact, the search for reality is the most dangerous of all undertakings for it destroys the world in which we live. Helen Vondemann wrote, 
that reality remains unknowable to us while we cling to our illusions. And this is essentially what is happening. But in archaics, we're not going to worry about the critics. We don't worry about the trolls, the naysayers, the disbelievers, those who are basically imagine they're 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 just impaired intellectually they are stunted in their imagination which is a spiritual a spiritual capacity the collective they don't they don't feel they don't think they don't they don't imagine you remember guys imagination intuition and empathy are the three core spiritual qualities that separate an individual from the collective but in archaics we follow basically the wisdom of American anthropologist Franz Boas, who wrote over a hundred years ago, record enough facts and the answers will fall to you like ripe fruit. This is why I'm always data mining. This is why I'm always showing you fact after fact after fact after fact. This is why I hold to the position and I say all the time that it's something is true. It can be seen from multiple different mathematical perspectives. In archaics, we will follow the genius of Sherlock Holmes, the brain, the brainchild of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who said, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And this is what we do. We examine the narratives that have been foisted upon us and we find out that upon critical examination, they fall apart under scrutiny. We have done this to the ancient aliens paradigm. And for those who come from the ancient aliens community and have divorced themselves from that programming, they have seen how the archaic's data dismantles the entire Zechariah Sitchin narrative, showing the mistranslations, show, showing that much of the data is true. However, the interpretation has been deliberately falsified. There is a breakaway civilization here and it does everything it can to make us believe that they are from space. They are extraterrestrial, when in fact, all alien abductions, UFOs, alien interventions, they all come from the underworld. And in my soul journeys through archaics, in my presentations, in my dealings with others, I am often confronted with those who come triggered, who have, who come in contact with the archaic's data and is, it is antithetical to anything that they have been programmed to believe. Not free thinkers, but people who have been exposed to the wrong information. It doesn't make them less intelligent, it, ma it makes them deceived. And many vehemently stick to their narratives because they don't want to undo sometimes a lifetime of research and I get that. And there are others that, that instantly go on the attack, coming across our cakes for the first time, and they're triggered into, into basically being hypercritical over things they know nothing about, information they haven't even assessed. I refer to those who imagine that in one day, they may discover all that, uh, that I have arrived at at 20 years of work. work. And this was, this was basically a problem that Rene Descartes also came across when he wrote that. So I forgive them this trespass. But I cannot back down or back away when the narratives are steady being promoted even though I have released the accurate data. We have very popular names in the world today who are deliberately putting out misinformation working in tandem with the establishment to promote these ideas. Uniformitarianism, this whole 65 million year old dinosaur age, followed by massive ages for which we have absolutely huge invented imagined gaps until we reach these ice ages. Guys, the ice age, the entire ice age phenomenon 
is just that. It is a phenomenon of theory and deception. Because they never happened. Dryas, Younger Dryas, these are fictive. The megafauna were temperate to tropical animals. And even those who are promoted by the establishment as free thinkers and mavericks, they're not. They're working with the establishment because even their own theories of Atlantis and of ancient super civilizations still promote the ideas of the uniformitarians, of Ice Age, and of all those things that we know now are false. For those of you who don't know, my name is Jason and this is Archaics. And we're, we're going to go far beyond these paradigms and we're going to begin smashing many of these ideas that have been so foisted upon the public.